Welcome. Thank you for your patience. My name is Suzanne Clary, and I am the president of the Jay Heritage Center. And I'm very excited to welcome you all to the John Jay Lecture, which is something that we have been doing for many years with the Pace School of Law, um, thanks to our board member, Nick Robinson, who is here tonight. Uh, Pace Law School and the Jay Heritage Center have a long-standing relationship um, uh, Nick and, and many other members uh, affiliated with the school, uh, including Dick Ottinger, who's also here tonight, um, were some of the first um, people to raise awareness about the threat posed to John Jay's boyhood home when it was going to be developed um, many, many years ago. Um, it was a 12-year battle that finally ended in 1992, and over 62 historic and environmental organizations rallied together to save the property. Um, we, we learned the art of collaboration. We worked with Westchester County Parks, represented today by John Baker, and I'm happy to welcome you here. We worked with State Parks. We have Ruth Pierpont, who is the Deputy Parks Commissioner for New York State Parks, and of course Rose Harvey, who is our current Commissioner of New York State Parks. Um, but it was a wonderful, uh, although very long, lesson in collaboration. And the important thing I learned is that um, the people that you can count on uh, during a challenge like that are also the most wonderful people to enjoy and collaborate with afterwards to enjoy the fruits of your labor. And so shortly after the property was saved in 1992, the first inaugural John Jay Lecture um, came about in 1994 with Anna Servant, who was the um, in charge of the archives of Jay Papers at Columbia University, another institution that we've been very fortunate to work with as we research John Jay, his legacy, and his site. And so this um, program is near and dear to our hearts. And sometimes it's been at Pace, and sometimes it's been here. Um, but we love having it here because we actually get to welcome you to John Jay's landmark home. Um, I'm going to introduce you to uh, the Dean of Pace Law School, David Yasky, who is then going to introduce our honored speaker. Again, I want to just thank you all for being here. I know it's a great day. There are other places that you could be. I want to thank my board um, who are here with us, other, other members of the community who collaborate with us, members of Con Edison who have been terrific sponsors of our, our sustainable programs. Um, we hope this is um, a, 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 the beginning of many more great gatherings like this. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate your, uh, your graciousness. I think it was uh, uh, my uh, late arrival that uh, delayed the proceedings, so you're, you're uh, gracious to uh, give me the applause notwithstanding. Uh, I, I am uh, relatively new uh, to, uh, to Pace Law School and, and thus to this partnership. Uh, I started uh, three weeks ago today uh, as the dean here, uh, or over there, I guess, at Pace. Um, but I know what a uh, terrific partnership this has been. Uh, Suzanne, thank you for uh, continuing that. Um, and I, I know most of you folks here are active in one way or another with the, uh, the center here, and I guess I just want to thank you and salute you for that. I am uh, an enormous admirer and fan, I guess, as uh, I'm sure most uh, Americans are. They, at least I stopped to think about it, uh, of John Jay. I have a, uh, in my office a photograph of the uh, gravesite of James Madison, and now that I'm here, I can, I've just learned I can make an appointment to go and see uh, uh, John Jay's resting place, and I, then I gotta track down Alexander Hamilton's. I can't be too far away. It must be in New York City somewhere. Um, but it's, it's particularly, an organization like this is particularly appropriate, not uh, just because, um, the, the John Jay home, but the, the tradition of citizen leadership and citizen participation uh, that um, the, the founders uh, created for us. My uh, research uh, as a scholar, uh, a lot of it was on the Second Amendment, uh, and John Jay and the other authors of the Federalist Papers, they wanted, uh, you know, they didn't want to have a, a, a big standing army, they wanted to have citizen militias. And that fit in with the rest of their vision. They believed that a democracy would only thrive and flourish uh, if um, the citizenry broadly, and of course they had a narrower idea maybe of what the citizenry was, but the broader citizenry than just the, the electeds uh, would uh, 
uh, participate. And you know, when uh, the, the um, uh, activism of this community and ensuring historic preservation uh, is exactly the kind of uh, uh, participation that they uh, had in mind and that they would so have admired. Um, I, I'm not, in fact, here to introduce uh, Rose Harvey. That, uh, I know uh, my colleague, Professor Green, is about to do. But I, the reason I was so enthusiastic to uh, join you here today was partly to introduce myself to our, uh, the, the, our, our partners, our neighbors uh, here, um, but also because I am personally such an admirer of Commissioner Harvey's work. Um, I served in the New York City government before coming here to face and um, Commissioner Harvey's uh, really exemplary leadership of the State Parks Agency, I think, is a model uh, for those of us who have been in public service. In particular, uh, I used to represent an area in North Brooklyn where the, the waterfront there has been transformed from uh, an abandoned industrial uh, area to a uh, spectacular waterfront park, um, made possible in large part because the state um, was willing to give up uh, its role to the city so that a single entity not uh, could proceed and, and create this park rather than have it be shared by both. And that's that never happens. I mean, you will never see uh, a government uh, agency say, no, we'll, we're willing to see it. So that, that, I think, is just, you know, and, and consonant, really, with the founder's example, right? What are we, uh, the best legacy that George Washington left us was to say, uh, that he would step back after his time as president and let the next generation take over that succession. Uh, you know, almost very few countries have been able to replicate that example of succession. And um, uh, the fact that the state uh, put that example forward is just one of the many reasons that I admire Commissioner Harvey. So uh, with that, though, before uh, Shelby uh, introduces you, uh, Shelby, will you come join me because we are here to present to Commissioner Harvey uh, as a token of our gratitude for this talk and our admiration for your uh, public service, um, a medal that has a name, no doubt, but it, we will call it, uh, okay, you know what? <laughs> Somebody wants to tell me the name of the medal. It's the J medal. Oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> It is the Pace, well, it says here the 2014 Pace Law School Medal. But anyway, let's call it for today the J Medal to Commissioner Bruce Harvey. Cities. 
Incredibly, there are many uh, who are not yet convinced of the imperatives of sustained efforts to secure and safeguard these resources. Uh, open spaces and historic structures are under constant pressure from development, uh, climate change, uh, even the climate. Political fights uh, over the use of these uh, resources abound. Indeed, uh, as Suzanne uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the fight to establish this very uh, center was uh, epic, one that uh, my colleagues, Nick Robinson and Dick Ottinger, won, and one that uh, Nick, uh, Nick Robinson will soon recount in his upcoming uh, book. Commissioner Harvey has long uh, taken up these challenges. On her appointment to the office of commissioner, she was widely hailed for her fashion and expertise in preserving open space and ensuring that the beauty and values of the natural world are preserved and accessible to all. She grew up on the outskirts of Baltimore in a neighborhood adjacent to a wonderful park around Lake Rowland. I went to college in Baltimore. Yeah, I could say hi. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure, you know, provided for many adventures and memories. Um, so it's not surprising that one of her first professional jobs in, in preservation was with the Maryland Environmental Trust in charge of uh, acquiring and conservation easements uh, to protect uh, private lands uh, from development. Then she went, went on to the Trust for Public Land, which is dedicated to conserving land for public use and enjoyment. Over the course of 27 years, she had multiple leadership positions, rising to the level of Senior Vice President and National Director of Urban Programs. She oversaw all real estate acquisitions, urban park design and developments, managing a multi-million dollar uh, operating budget, and closed as much as $75 million of worth of land and parks uh, transactions uh, each year across eight states. Lever leveraging the philosophical and financial support that comes from uh, public, private, and public not-for-profit partnerships, under her leadership, the Trust for Public Land and many major preservation achievements in New York. Some stand out above others. Uh, there was a 2,500-acre tract of wilderness along the Schwanka uh, Ridge in Ulster County, uh, used to expand the adjoining Midwaska State Park uh, Preserve. The ghosts consist of uh, cliffs, forests, waterfalls, lakes, situated south of the Catskill uh, Mountains, the ridge running for 48 uh, miles on the west side of the Hudson River. The area is popular among rock climbers, hikers, and artists. Then there was a 575-acre tract in the heart of Sterling Forest. After a developer proposed to build 107 mini estates on the tract, the Trust for Public Land, allied with local groups, worked for nearly 10 years and eventually acquired the tract and transferred it to the state. When Sterling Forest was acquired in 1998, it was the largest acquisition in the state's park system for in over 50 years. Uh, the park is a mountainous corridor of more than 100,000 uh, acres, dense with red and black oaks, maples, hemlocks, and white pines. And its wildlife, wildlife includes black bears, bobcats, coyotes, and rattlesnakes. First of all, I could do without the rattlesnakes. Uh, then there's a 1,200-acre tract on the Big Indian Plateau, contributed uh, greatly to the State Forest Preserve. So the big Indian wilderness area and the adjoining slide mountain wilderness area together make up the largest contiguous tract of wilderness in Catskill Park. So the values of forests and wilderness uh, areas aside, Commissioner Har uh, Harvey has long embraced the belief that urban parks are getaways for the millions of silly city dwellers who visit them daily. They serve people close to home in their communities. Open spaces in cities provide recreation, relaxation, and connection to nature that is affordable and accessible. Under her leadership, the Trust for Public Land partnered with the Bloomberg <coughs> Administration and the Booker Administration in Newark uh, for the development of hundreds of school playgrounds open during and after school, countless neighborhood gardens that replace derelict patches of asphalt, Stating off uh, the determined uh, effort by the Giuliani administration to auction uh, these neighborhood gardens uh, off. And there are scores of pocket parks created in inter interstitial spaces that provide an experience of respite uh, from the city. Commissioner Harvey has worked to shape the agenda and direction of preservation efforts through her service and her leadership positions at various philan philanthropic uh, and conservation organizations, including the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, the 
Yale Leadership Advisory Council, the Appalachian Mountain Club, the Hudson River Institute, and the Walsh Park Low Income Housing. She is a recipient of numerous state and national awards for her efforts and advocacy. Her views and insights have appeared in many articles and op-eds in national media outlets and industry trade journals. Now as commissioner, she's in charge of nearly 200 state parks, three dozen state historic sites, and scores of state heritage areas. So in the preamble to the statute creating the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, the legislature recognized the abundance of natural, scenic, ecological, and recreational resources in the state uh, and their importance, the spirit, the light, and edification of the citizens. It declared that stewardship of these resources is a primary responsibility of the state. We are very grateful to have Commissioner Harvey to address us tonight on what that stewardship means and requires. Please welcome Commissioner a true home, not just a place to live. 
we led many causes, including civil rights, the rights for women, gay, the labor movement. After all, all three women from the Supreme Court are from New York State. And our, our architectural legacy is like none other. These New York places are rich, they're deep, and they're hugely important for our future. And we need to know them, we need to understand them, we need to feel them, and then they will guide us. Maybe they'll humble us, maybe they'll inspire us, maybe they will motivate them. But we need to understand them. And it's only fitting that we're here at the Jay Heritage Center celebrating John Jay, his history, his legacy. We're the boyhood home of the only Native founding father, the first Chief Justice of the United States, the author of the New York of New York's Constitution, two-time governor, abolitionist, and patriarch of several generations of similarly public-minded descendants. It's a, it's a reminder of how many great leaders called their home New York, and it's a real state of pride that we preserve this home, and we're going to all have to uh, read the next book of, about that epic battle uh, that was so important, and here we are today interpreting uh, the history of John Jay. And so, uh, as well, we have the John Jay Homestead in Bedford, and it's it's so important that in the future, the future, or that future generations can reflect on Jay's vision that formed the foundation, the very foundation of our democracy. So given uh, my land preservation background, uh, after being commissioner of parks, recreation, and historic preservation is a great honor, but it's daunting, given this great storied legacy uh, that needs to be preserved, interpreted, and instilled in our future generations. And yet, the roots, the philosophy, the tools, the goals of land conservation and historic preservation are the very same, and they're so connected, they're so symbiotic. Both conservation and preservation strive to connect and to link, to link people to the history, to their roots, to their heritage, to link people to land, to the environment and to nature. And it's in these connections that we make that everyone can begin to understand their place in nature and their place in history. And yet, both worlds are not, but should be ever present in our modern consciousness and our lives. But our appreciation for and understanding of them are still too remote, they're too separate, they're not fully woven into our daily lives, and they need to be. And that's what we all together are striving to do. And as Tony Hiss points out in many of his books, you know, our relationships, our communities are shaped by our, phys our physical relationships. Every, com every community is a combination of small pictures. Maybe it's a field, a town commons, a barn. And our perception of those places creates our sense of place. So when they're indiscriminately bulldozed down, that field disappears, that town commons appears, that barn, John and Jay's house is indiscriminately bulldozed, then we sever our connectedness, our awareness, <coughs> our understanding. They're all necessary to make multi-generational decisions. And as Wendell Berry stated, you cannot know who you are until you know where you are. So thank goodness for the Jay Heritage Center and its extensive marshland, that symbiotic relationship. And thank you that you all stand together, conserved as you once were and you always will be. It's just another example of important historic preservation. Three years ago, when Governor Cuomo first appointed me, I have no real understanding of the depth, breadth, majesty of the New York State system of 173 state parks, 35 historic sites, and six historic parks. It's one of the oldest systems in the country. And interestingly enough, it was created at the turn of the, in, in the early 1900s to serve 
the rapidly urbanizing working class of the Industrial Revolution. And so you will find most of our parks are outside of the cities, outside of Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, over 100,000 acres of wilderness-like areas surrounding New York City, starting with the Palisades, and May, Englewood, and LG protect and honor this legacy, and we hope that will happen. It's also full of notable firsts. Niagara Falls is the oldest state park in the country. Washington headquarters was the first privately purchased, acquired uh, public historic site for uh, public interpretation. Jones Beach is one of the largest world in the world bathing beaches. The walkway over the Hudson is the longest pedestrian walkway, or so we say, but China has been writing to say it's not true. <laughs> We're also the most developed uh, park system. We have hotels, concert halls, restaurants, three, um, well, three 15,000 seated concert halls, dams, bridges, 5,000 buildings, many of them on the National Register, and 60 million visitors a year. We're the second most heavily visited park system in the country and a uh, third you know, fifth in acreage. This is both a daunting uh, challenge but a great opportunity. Uh, but we've had 40 years of no real capital investment in the stewardship of our parks. And it's really only recently that parks and historic sites, though one of the largest infrastructures of the state, was put into the capital consciousness of Albany, the stewardship aspect of its protection. As well, our State Historic Preservation Office oversees a robust, robust historic preservation program, one of the best in the nation, protecting and stewarding not only our own sites, but also helping communities preserve their architectural and cultural legacy, and in doing so, reaping the cultural, economic, environmental benefits that we all know are associated with historic preservation. So there are three fundamental ways that New York State protects our rich cultural heritage. We provide stewardship for important historic and cultural landmarks that are within our state park system. We connect people to historic places, and we interpret those historic those stories that are so important and such a big part of New York State's history. As Cormac McCarthy wrote, often things separate from their story have no meaning. They're only shapes of a certain size and color or weight. So when their meaning gets lost, they no longer have a name. The story, on the other hand, can never be lost from its place in the world, for it is that place. We tell the stories of history. Finally, we work with communities to survey, to access, and list on the state survey and the National Register their historic properties so those sites will be available for grants, tax credits, protection efforts, interpretation, and celebration. So let's start with stewardship. New York State's breathtaking and venerable park system is one of the most treasured public accesses. Unfortunately, this park system's acclaimed status has been threatened by four decades of neglect and decay. Once celebrated destinations have become shabby, unwelcoming, a symbol of disinvestment. Historic buildings have been shuttered, recreational facilities are boarded up and closed, bathrooms unusable, playgrounds rusted and unsafe. It all added up to a $1.1 billion backlog of capital projects. Leading park advocates in 2010 wrote, the state park system is now in crisis, and called the, park the closed park facilities a symbol of Albany dysfunction. And they, they were correct. We, are, we were and still are a bit in crisis, but we're now moving to dig ourselves out. Governor Andrew M. Cuomo uh, began and begins the reverse of this course of stewardship. Since 2012, the governor's New York Works program, with plenty of support from the state legislature, 
has made a $90 million annual long-term commitment to revitalizing state parks. We are now in the capital budget of the New York uh, state budget. State parks is poised to leverage these funds with other public and private partnerships, such as the one here, and we hope with these monies over the next seven years, an annual 90 million, that we can build to a $1 million investment to begin to reverse some of the decay of the past. It will, this investment will make it possible to repair the park, the park system, protect its environmental significance, reopen its recreational facilities, and revive its historic significance. To date, this investment, the governor's investment, has helped us tackle long deferred projects at 81 parks and historic sites, and there's much more to do. So, you're most interested in the main goal and the effort to restore and revitalize our historic sites and cultural assets and to help communities with their own restoration efforts. Uh, it, with respect to the restoration in our park system, we're protecting historic landmarks and our own historic sites. We're advancing overdue projects to improve historic buildings, structures, and landscapes including repairs to the roofs, the windows, the exterior features to protect the integrity build of the buildings. We're talking infrastructure. Uh, we're honoring, we will honor the work of New York artisans and craftspersons. For instance, FDR Civilian Conservation Corps left its fabulous mark and masonry signature all through our central and western regions. New York has the most CC, CCC workers in any state uh, in America, and uh, they left us this huge legacy. And we're in the process of preserving their work and the work of all skilled laborers and restoring this intricate stonework and distinctive building. And we don't want to lose or disrespect that story of the CCC and the building of the state and our national park system. We're also protecting and accessing the public's historic collections. We're modernizing technology to make it easier to access all our sites, just physically. Online reservations, ability to use credit cards, easy pass is the most heavily used. But we're also using the technology to protect and expand the public's valued collections of art, furniture, books, textiles, that are all at or within our historic sites. At Washington's headquarters, we've developed an electronic catalog using iPads, which will allow visitors to research any piece from the vast collection, whether or not it is on display. We've installed, with our partner, our uh, not-for-profit partner, Walkway Over the Hudson, new signs have been installed on Walkway Over the Hudson that promotes all the state historic sites in the Hudson Valley grouping them by theme, whether revolutionary war sites or grand mansions. And these signs, by using your smartphone and scanning of the QR codes, will link to an interactive multimedia mobile web which will tell a much larger story. We're also re reviving and transforming our historic flagships, starting with Jones Beach and Niagara Falls, which are the most historic parks in the nation. We're well underway on a $50 million restoration plan to bring back the Frederick, Frederick Law Olmsted inspired landscape in Niagara Falls State Park, the oldest state park in the nation. Popular but highly worn uh, and visitor areas such as Three Sister Islands are being transformed with pedestrian walkways, enhanced landscaping, new benches, lampposts, and railing that will be consistent all throughout the park. Three weeks ago, the governor announced his $65 million plan to reinvigorate the beloved Jones Beach State Park on the Long Island coast, including the restoration of the park's historic and aesthetic grandeur, as imagined by vis visionary park builder Robert Moses. We've started, and actually we're almost finished, with the rehab of the iconic West Bathhouse, the 1930 Art Deco building that anchors the park's boardwalk. And as you know, Jones Beach and all of the 50 miles of parkland and coastland parks that we own on Long Island were hit very hard by Sandy, 
So this new design that Jones Beach is tackling the interface between resiliency and historic preservation in a partnership that I believe will work and will be a model for the future. However, make no mistake that in spite of these ambitious goals, the need is overwhelming and we will impact a fraction of the repair that must be done. But we're in the first two years of uh, the restoration of 40 years of neglect. But we've got five more years of 90 million and we have the partnerships such as you, uh, such as yours, and uh, we're very hopeful that we will make a substantial dent. And uh, I, we also again thank you for the partnership with Jay Heritage Center, friends of John Jay, who will raise and have raised millions toward restoration and interpretation of the sites. And you really will make the difference and you will leverage our state money. And of course, we must continue to connect these improved sites uh, to our communities because unless they become relevant in education, to our sense of place, to our day-to-day -day lives, we will be at a distinct disadvantage in making the case for more funding. And then who will make the case? We must make that connection. And that goes to my next, the three areas of focus, stewardship and connection. And so with connection, we're beginning to restore, we're beginning to make them relevant, we're beginning to make them educational tools, our historic sites. And we're doing this to instill the history, the roots, the context, to build a preservation, we're building a preservation consciousness. And for instance, in our nature parks, we connect all to the environment, to the land, not only for our human happiness, for our health, for our social well-being, but to build a land ethic in the next generation. As the naturalist Robert Michael Pyle says, what is the extinction of the condor to a child who has never known a wren? So it's the same with historic sites. We want people to visit, learn about these landmarks, so they too will become the future historians and the stewards for the future of our heritage sites. And uh, an Af African chief wrote, after all, in the end, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. So it is that next generation that will be making the case for the funding, and we need to make the case for them and to them. So each year, we have 200,000 school children that come and visit regularly to our 35 historic sites and park and all our parks and yet that's only a fraction of our 60 million annual visitors so we've targeted this school population with a goal and it's a modest goal and hopefully we'll far exceed it of a one percent increase in visitation by our school children each year for the next five years Governor Cuomo is, is a true historian, a lover of, of history, and avid uh, reader of history. And he's been in the forefront of this effort to make history ever present, ever relevant, and completely act accessible to everyone. He completed, in record time, the long overdue rehabilitation of the state capitals. But he took it a step further, and he made the capital and its newly restored grandeur, a living museum, if even a museum, a living place to go and work in. He's reopened the, to the public the Hall of Governors. He collected and restored the portraits of, with the help of Ruth Shaw, the portraits of each of the state governors. His father was the most difficult portrait to get, but he got it. <laughs> I think he tricked him, but he got it. Um, and each and every one of them is represented in this hall. As well, he brings in new exhibits every month. Right now, I'm marking the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Our agency is displaying an exhibit of battle flags from the New York regiments that have been preserved by our conservators. I browse every day in the course of work at the hall, in the hall of governors or our exhibit as do the lobbyists at 
you can get their face out of their phone, <laughs> but as also the countless number of visitors and school children that come. Uh, it is, I learn every day, I learn another lesson from history. As well, New York State has more museums, curators, historical societies, exhibition halls, colleges, and universities than any other state in the country. And it makes sense, it's representative of so many of the stories and the deep history, but it can also be problematic in the individual silos that we have. New York's new path through history developed by the governor is a statewide roadmap, literally and figuratively, that takes the first step to try to tie them together thematically, whether it's women's rights or the Underground Railroad, whatever it is, but tie these historically and culturally significant sites, locations, and events time together throughout the Empire State. This new effort showcases and interprets our history and our heritage, but also it promotes tourism and economic development <coughs> in communities in every region in the state. Governor believes deeply that historic parks and historic preservation are integral to New York's tourism and economic development efforts, which is probably the highest uh, priority, one of the highest, highest priorities of the governor's economic development. And just our system alone, our parks and historic sites alone, each year generate $1.9 billion in local acti economic activity outside of them and 20,000 jobs outside of them in tourism or restaur restaurants or whatever it may be. Understanding this ripple effect, the, New York has woven, the governor has woven New York's parks, our districts, our heritage areas, the landmark here, special places into ver the very visible I Love New York tourism advertisement. He's invested significant dollars in this multimedia outreach, and it's on, you may have seen, it's on TV, bus stops, subways. It's inviting people to come and visit, explore, experience our history, our parks, our environment. And uh, in doing this, we've tapped in to a whole new pot of advertising for historic preservation and historic sites. As well, the regional economic development grants are giving millions of dollars to our natural and historic areas. So historic preservation is beginning to benefit from no, some new sources of funding and promotion. And, our le our, and we're leveraging our very scarce resources to the extent that we can continue to do so, we should. The third piece of our focus um, is the larger historic preservation program. I've talked about our efforts to preserve and conserve our own state park system and our own historic sites, and yet our agency's role as the State Historic Preservation Office, SHPO, takes us far beyond our own boundaries and into the broader field of preservation to provide programs and services that identify and celebrate a wide range of local and community resources and serve so many. Our State Historic Preservation Office is charged with carrying out both federal and state historic preservation laws. And in doing so, we work with community to add thousands of properties and neighborhoods to the statewide historic resources and inventory. And to do so, that links preservation to the local community planning process. Plan to protect, understand what you have in your community, plan for it and list it. We then submit and qualify nominations for listing on the state and national registers of historic place, making thousands of properties eligible for federal and state historic rehab tax credits, historic preservation grant. New York State leads the nation in the number of listings. There are 88,594 listings nationwide on the National Register. New York State has the most at 5,529. Each year, our office reviews and qualifies hundreds of millions of dollars worth of historic re rehabilitation, rehabilitation tax credit projects for income producing and owner-occupied properties. We have a certified local government program 
that advances preservation activities through a combination of technical assistance and grants to communities. And our SHPO reviews thousands of new federal and state projects for their impacts on historic and cultural resources, including fast-tracking hundreds of emergency projects. Imagine the demand to fast-track either the demolition or the renovation of all the homes and all of the places impacted by Irene, Lee, Super Storm Sandy. Uh, and we, we need to make that review quick and easy uh, so that the homeowners can go on. We are also managing a new federally funded grant program of $13 million to assist with Sandy-related repair and rehabilitation. So we encourage anybody uh, and everybody to apply. New York also leads the country in the number of National Historic Landmark designations. With only... <laughs> Yay! <laughs> So, and right here, uh, we have the Boston Post Road Historic District. It shares company with the Brooklyn Bridge, Camp Sagamore, and uh, the Peter J. House is the centerpiece of the landmark district. So, uh, welcome to, to robust and wonderful company. And if you review the listings of the National Register programs and how it's evolved over the years, you can see also how our perceptions of what is important in New York history and culture have changed and, and also evolved. The National Register began, as I think we all know, as a program to preserve the visual environment, beautiful buildings and places that were threatened by contemporary development policies. The loss in 1963 of New York City's original Penn Station galvanized an entire movement. In these early years, which also corresponded with the end of urban renewal, our priority was to list the most aesthetically important landmarks, as well as properties associated with seminal historic events in, of our state, such as battlefields of the colonial and early Republican period. However, the preservation moved, it evolved quickly, and we moved on from valuing primarily civic buildings and prominent mansions to historic districts and cultural landscapes. Expanding scholarship and maturity brought an understanding and pre appreciation of vernacular architecture. For example, we listed not just mansions, but the homes of early settlers and of the average workers. We also listed resources associated with the diverse ethnic and immigrant groups that populate our state. As I said earlier, immigration is a hugely important theme in our history, and New York City's Lower East Side is synonymous with immigration in America and its growth and development during the 20th century. Notable listings include New York City's Garment District and Lower East Side Historic District, that document the city's Jewish immigrant population. In the future, we must strive to recognize more recent immigration heritage, including Latino sites, which are underrepresented in the National Register program. Our listings also include properties associated with progressive social history. We're enormously proud that New York has the first site in the country listed for its association with the gay and lesbian civil rights movement. Stonewall is regarded by many as the single most important catalyst for this movement. But until recently, it was the only site in the country to represent this theme. There are now three, two of which are in New York, in, in New York including Stonewall and Cherry Grove Playhouse and Theater on Fire Island, which was listed last summer. And of course, women's rights, labor movement, abolition movement, all are very rep well represented on the National Register. Through the years, National Register grew to embrace a great diversity of more modern properties, such as the 20th century landmarks associated with popular American pastimes and entertainment values, as well as new modes of transportation and travel. They included amusement parks, I think you might know this one. Um, <laughs> Roadside architecture, uh, yes. you know, this one's 
Uh, and even great modern architecture, such as the TWA terminal, 1962 to 70. Each year, our office submits approximately 100 nominations for listing, most of which document the more traditional districts and sites. And in 2012, approximately one-third of our nominations were motivated by tax credits or grants. Which brings me to one of the brightest lights for the future of preservation, and that is the Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program. After many years, historic preservation has been mainstreamed to the point where it's generally accepted as an important economic development tool, and tax credits are the key to that acceptance. The long-standing 20% federal tax credit for income-producing properties on the National Register has been going strong in New York for decades, but decades. But I'm proud to say that our use of federal tax credit has been breaking all kinds of national records in the past two years, with projects representing well over a billion dollars of private investment just in 2013. These projects are tangible examples that historic preservation can drive economic development and job creation. However, we need to make sure that the federal preservation tax credits remain intact in the future so the communities across the state and county and country can continue to reap the enormous benefits of these really substantial financial incentives. This pressure to eliminate tax credits may be one of the single largest threats to historic preservation at uh, this moment in time. We, we need to monitor and fight it, and we'll just put pace law. <laughs> in the past, uh, virtually all New York State tax credit projects were located downstate. But this has changed drastically over the last several years, and we believe that the main reason for the shift upstate and to smaller projects is most likely the availability of the New York State Historic Tax Credit Program. For listed buildings located in qualifying lower income census tracts, the state program provides a parallel 20% commercial credit to the federal credit with a $5 million maximum cap and a 20% credit for homeowners with a $50,000 maximum cap. Many areas of the state qualify, uh, particularly upstate, for these additional incentives. And just last year, over 140 residential units were rehabbed under the homeowners tax credits. Last year, the governor included in his budget an extension to these programs to 2019. They were about to expire. And as well, and, and improved to the commercial credit, uh, it provided more incentives for out-of-state in investment uh, in these tax credits that had been previously denied. In the midst of our state and federal tax credit successes, I'd be remiss in not mentioning that there continue to be uh, additional challenges to, to making it all work. One is the abandonment of older resources that once formed a central place in community life. But because of cultural lifestyle, lifestyle changes, large spaces such as armories, theaters, community halls, and most recently a growing number of underused and abandoned religious properties are no longer actively used. A rapidly emergency, uh, emerging challenge to historic preservation is how to adapt these large sanctuary and assembly spaces to new uses. There have been some great successes in adaptive use. For example, the former Asbury Delaware Methodist Church in Buffalo was threatened with demolition and saved and transformed into a, record, a, a recording studio and performance by recording artist Bonnie DeFranco. But given that there's so many of these sites and the cost is often so high, we must seek opportunities to maybe revisit and adjust our established preservation standards to accommodate the creation of contemporary uses within these large vacant spaces so the sites can be used as a business, a restaurant, a visitor center, um, a home, part, uh, and make them part of our daily uh, exists. It's not always a museum separate and alone to be visited, only occasionally. 
So, on a final note, I'm going to come back full circle to that intersection between environmental conservation and historic preservation and uh, just remind everybody in our restoration efforts that it is the greenest built, the greenest buildings are the ones that are already built, the ones that are restored. Uh, they're restored with green technology in their rehabilitation, but also the reuse of existing buildings means less energy expended for transportation, new materials, it means less sprawl, it means more conservation of open land. So historic preservation and conservation are two sides of the same very valuable coin. So again, thank you very, very much. Uh, I hope I've underscored New York State's great legacy in historic preservation. And uh, really this legacy, there's a, a reason for it, and it's through the work of friends, supporters, New York citizens, uh, people like every one of you. Uh, and thank you for your interest in history, your participation, your wisdom, your patience to make it all happen. It's a great duty and responsibility, uh, but you picked it up, uh, you've taken the challenge, and now we'll hand it down to the next generation. Uh, and I, I, we appreciate everything that you've done. Retreated. With respect to historic preservation, 
you know, I think, again, one of the big uh, tools, one of the most important tools are those tax credits. Mm -hmm. uh, and as long as we can keep them uh, as they are or even improve them, because on one hand, there's a movement to eliminate them. On the other hand, there's a, a movement to even expand them. Uh, they're very, very effective uh, in doing so. But uh, in terms of actually, the state's not going to be able to, uh, you know, fill the void uh, in terms of dollars, but uh, also partnerships as well. Uh, you know, public-private partnerships, fundraising, and also, again, what I alluded to in, in this talk is uh, starting to tap into some other uh, non-traditional pots of money, whether it's at the state or the county, which is economic development. And I, I haven't seen that before, or at least to the level uh, that they're flowing uh, right now under Governor Cuomo. Um, you know, if we could do more of that, uh, that would also add, would be additive in new sources of dollars. Ruth or Carol, do you have anything? You, you were talking about Preserve America and Save America's treasures being eliminated. I don't see how we could pick that up on the state level. These are two federal programs that went away. Um, they have been keeping up the Historic Preservation Fund. Congress has been good about that, and the President's budget has kept it pretty level. So but we use that for operating funds. I guess probably the best state, um, we have a great EPF program, the Environmental Protection Fund, and that's just we have a lot more than other states do as far as the state providing funding for nonprofits and municipalities. But there's no replacing those two programs. It's a shame. I have a question. Now. I'm going to show that I'm not up on things as I usually am. Uh, the Hudson River Valley Greenway, the heritage area program that Maurice Henshi was trying to um, you know, dovetail with the national park system. The idea was to have a study as to whether that would that would work, and, and that the national park system could also put some money into the. If you think of it, if you come at it from another angle, I think that's great, and and certainly volunteers are essential. But I don't know that much about the Common Core, but I know it drives everything right now, and you know there are pros and cons, I guess. But have you considered working it into the curriculum? No. Because uh, that common core discussion is, will overshadow everything. That that needs to happen in a whole different place. So, um, uh, being so a little bit familiar with that issue, uh, you be wade into a morass there. So, um, you know, we're going to keep it separate for now until that settles out. And uh, really, more it's is making connection. Right. Even this more I, I wrote down. You can't know who you are until you know where you are. And I thought that was a great quote. And I just think about those school kids and how applicable that is. No, it's, we're not giving up. I'm yeah. just saying I, I think it's probably much more effective to start making connections with teachers and classes. We'll get there. And then at a later time, we may be able to get more systematic uh, about it. But we're doing this in the moment uh, for that. Uh, in the in the uh, in this area, we're we're speaking once again of the discussions come up again about dissolving a layer of government, uh, which is basically the town of Rye. With that dissolution comes a problem that there are certain properties that are owned by the town, which are historic sites, that are sort of in flux because we're not sure if the, uh, the the municipalities that are left would be able to take them over. And, 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 uh, has, there, has there been anything in the state that could act as a guide for uh, these sites? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, the, the, this, the easy answer would be, gee, could the state come and help and add them to the system? But, oh, gee. Yeah, yeah I know. I know. <laughs> struggling uh, to renovate and restore and revitalize our 35 and our six uh, historic parks. But, uh, you know, we can certainly, uh, 
you know, each site is, is going to have to be partnership by partnership, or, you know, it's just, just going to have to work site by site to find the right formula or the, the right solution uh, for it. And we, we can certainly, in many of our pro outreach programs, give as much advice and technical assistance, and, you know, encourage them and you to call oh. our offices, for sure. I just had a stayed on comment about slave lands. I grew up on Long Island where there's so many wonderful shoreline state parks. Jones Beach, Robert Moses, Montauk, Wildwood, Thompson, on and on. You go to Westchester County, the shoreline is all in private hands, private clubs, yeah. beach clubs. If this sustainable playland collapses, which I think it might, I think it'd be a great opportunity for the state to just Westchester County wants to get rid of it because it loses two million dollars plus or more every year. So it would be a great <laughs> preservation of shoreline and also a historical significance is tremendous. So you know we've um, we have a, a an internal role. I, I mean my eyes. I mean, it, yes, <laughs> we would love it, and yes, we would like it for the historic sites. But we. Um, we're third of what we were uh, in terms of operation, but we have taken on you know, two new state parks, and, but we, the condition of taking them on is that in both cases we've, we've raised privately um, or found operational endowments that will throw off enough money to not completely take care of the situation, but add substantial dollars for fear that if we take any more, but come to us if it if it falls, and you're going to come to us on the starter side. Uh, you mentioned that there were a lot of historic sites in New York, museums, uh, sort of societies, and so on. Uh, you only represent a small portion of this vast land. Right, three percent is that what you said? Oh, yeah, tiny, oh, yeah. tiny percent. Uh, is there any kind of a collaborative effort of working with the rest of the historic community uh, to sort of get things done in Albany so you're not just operating alone? And I have a, a second question if I may. Uh, I know some historic sites, state sites, have friends groups. And they work a little like PTAs in some schools. You know, they can add a lot to it, but other sites don't really have those friends groups for whatever reason, so they tend to then lose out, which doesn't always seem fair in some way, so I wonder if you can comment on those two. Um, on the second question, uh, you know, our partner groups are, you know, hugely important, um, and our friends groups. And for those that don't, uh, actually we have a, we have, you know, somebody dedicated to try to organize and help get them started, but sometimes it's just, not the right situation, uh, or the you know the community is not interested yeah. enough. But to the extent that we well, can, well, yes, exactly. Um, and so th there, what you do is you in the right places you find friends group, and then the state's got to step in and pay a little bit more for the operating budget of those sites that are not in those affluent areas or have groups that that can help. <coughs> Um, in, in terms of all the different sites, um, I, I mean, they, they, you know, do get together and, and, and talk. I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure you're thinking about how they, they could come together. All of you. Um, the, the problem is that a lot of the, um, the historic sites and special places are special because of the place of where they are and what they're, the story they're interpreting. So it's not as if they could all, uh, you know, just merge into one area, but putting, creating umbrellas, uh, we always try to do that. We have the heritage areas and you have the districts and so forth and so on. And the governor's trying to pack through the history to kind of tie them together thematically uh, and give them publicity. Uh, as well, but um, it, it, it is a bit of a conundrum because there's so many and, and 
in so many different places, but to tie them together as, as best as we can. I want to thank you.